Welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today I'm joined by Paul Hare, who is a senior lecturer and interim director at the Center for Latin American Studies at Boston University. Additionally, in the past, Paul was a British diplomat for 30 years and served as the British ambassador to Cuba from 2001 to 2004. Lastly, he is also the author of the book, Making Diplomacy Work, Intelligent Innovation for the Modern World. So, Paul, thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So when did you first get interested in the world of diplomacy? Um, <laughs> well, I, I kind of wanted to travel. And uh, my first inclination was maybe to join an international law firm or a bank or something like that. And I did work for five years in the private sector, but then realized that there were going to be limited opportunities to travel and only to a kind of small number of places where these outfits had um, offices. And I then started meeting some people who were in the foreign office. And um, I guess they encouraged me to start the entry process. It's a long process. It takes over a year, different periods, uh, you know, exams and stages and whatnot. So you have to be committed to it. And that's what happened. I got in and uh, got the uh, wish to travel, but also a wide variety of subject matter, international matter, which you encounter around the world. That, that's one of the, I think, great benefits of a foreign service career is the sheer variety of raw material you deal with. Yeah, I've met a lot of people in the foreign services in the U.S. Um, from spending a lot of time in Uzbekistan. I was doing a lot of stuff at the embassy there. And it is amazing how much of the world you get to see when you're in the foreign service because you just get sent all over the place. Uh, <laughs> Out. Yeah, I mean, even, of course, you have to do home stints. They don't want you to go native entirely. So, but sure. then there's so many international meetings. I did a lot on arms control and uh, export control of uh, you know, uh, military equipment and so on. And there are lots of international groups which meet pretty regularly. So, And we did a lot of bilateral meetings on arms control. We went to Iran, Israel, Egypt, China. Japan, Korea. I mean, it was, you know, we did a lot of international outreach based in London. So that was obviously uh, a good eye opener as well. Yeah, it's a pretty good spectrum of places. So definitely mm -hmm. going to see a lot that way. Uh -huh. Now, obviously, when it comes to diplomacy, you've written um, in the past about sort of WikiLeaks and how that intersects with the, the field of diplomacy in general. Um, I'm curious because, you know, obviously there are still, uh, you know, Julian Assange is still in the news when it comes to, you know, whether he's going to get, you know, sent to the U.S. or not. And so I guess we're kind of looking at the legacy of WikiLeaks now at, at this point in time. Um, you know, what was your initial reaction, though, when WikiLeaks first came about um, from a diplomatic standpoint? What were you thinking about it? Well, um, I mean, the WikiLeaks organization, you, before the leaks of the diplomatic cables, was one of the many, um, not many, but one of the more prominent sort of transparency promoting organizations. This was in the era of obviously post-Cold War, when there was supposedly a new openness. It was the era of growth of social media, online comments, digitalization, of course, without which WikiLeaks wouldn't have been able to do very much at all. So it was all part of an effort by some who saw the diplomatic process, business processes overly secret and corrupt and to promote transparency. So there's an organization in Germany, Transparency International, for instance, which has similar means. So I think Julian Assange was seemingly motivated by that. I think he had also political ambitions in Australia he was, he actually ran, I think, for Senate seats. So he he saw himself as a kind of general activist in promoting, you might say, a progressive agenda that the old world order was in some way corrupt and too, um, too closed. It was deceiving publics. It was deceiving the kind of international community, which was all about globalization and new openness with the internet offering, of course, enormous possibilities. That's why I guess they chose the, you know, the title Wiki. Wikipedia has been extremely yeah. successful, which many people predicted it wouldn't be, but it, it was kind of part of that movement. Yeah. And so, you know, 
when it came onto the scene and and you kind of uh, summarize a bit about his background, did that give you some skepticism about, you know, oftentimes when people are trying to uh, assume that everything is hopelessly uh, a disaster politically in the world that, you know, oh, I can go and fix it. That obviously probably raises skepticism for a lot of people, given that's fairly unrealistic. Yeah, that's right. I mean, he he obviously evolved and he's still evolving as an individual and did others associated with him at the time. You might say Glenn Greenwald and, uh, and of course, um, Edward Snowden, who's who's now residing in Moscow, um, they perhaps had different motivations, but I think they became increasingly embittered with um, particular countries, which they saw as, and they they felt a need to express their kind of grievance with certain countries. If you're going to be a transparency activist uh, and open information and so on, you have to be even-handed. You can't just accuse one diplomatic actor of, um, uh, you know, dirty tricks and uh, hypocrisy and covering up, you know, the worst side of, of human nature in their diplomatic cables. You have to recognize realistically, and of course, all diplomats do recognize that, that every country does the same. That is part of the job of a diplomat is to make reports on events in your from your embassy or on your issues, which are not um, necessarily um, beneficial for the general public to read in terms of promoting a settlement, because a lot of settlements, rather like making sausages, involve some fairly, you might say, dirty deals in, in between countries, as in between businesses or between NGOs or whatever. And therefore, for a diplomat, if you're going to release cables of one country, then to be credible and you might say to be respected in the same way, I think that Transparency International is respected, uh, you have to be even handed. You have to take the same position with regard to the United States that you, you or you have to take with China or with Russia or, or Uzbekistan or whatever. You have to recognize that what we're trying to do is promote greater openness in world diplomacy. We're not trying to embarrass one country and give the impression to the world that they're totally off limits, that they're playing a different game from the other 195 countries. Yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense. And I think that's something that um, tends to be over the head of a lot of the general public, since so many people just don't understand how governments <laughs> operate. And so I guess... You know, one of the concerning things when it comes to these organizations like WikiLeaks is that lots of people just kind of assume they can't do harm because they're not a government. Um, and in reality, you know, they can do great harm because there's lots of complexities to government relations and how these things work. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and the job of a diplomat in an embassy, whether it's in Washington or wherever, is to report things as they see them. and. If your negotiating position is weak, for instance, if you disagree with points that your government's trying to make, or if you disagree with some aspects of a military operation as a diplomat, you would report that, of course, in encrypted fashion. You, it's not something you would send to the New York Times if you're because you're serving a government, you're representing your government. And what what the, the cables, of course, showed that he leaked WikiLeaks was that diplomats report honestly. I mean, there was a case, I don't know whether you remember, um, Ben, a, a few years ago, that um, the British ambassador in Washington had sent a cable on how he would advise the British government in working with the Trump administration. And that cable was leaked mm, okay, by yeah. the, British, the British tabloids. And, of course, it became impossible for him to work in Washington. It was made perfectly clear on Twitter by the president that he was no longer welcome. Uh, so he, he, he was removed. I mean, that was a similar instance to, to what WikiLeaks did. It, of course, damaged a lot of careers, but the information wasn't, re you know, the sensitive information wasn't redacted, largely in all the hundreds of thousands of cables that were released. And of course, it endangered many lives. I know personally, 
some lives that were endangered in, in places I served in. So that is, is something that, of course, he has to take responsibility for. Maybe he knew or maybe he was just ignorant of, of the process. So that is, is, of course, damaging to diplomacy. But of, he then moved on. Um, I mean, he, he did the Podesta um, hacking leaks, of course, yeah. during an, an American election campaign immediately after the Access Hollywood tape was public. I think within hours, he timed the re release of that. So clearly he was working again, you might say, on election interference at that stage. He got the information. He seemingly chose the timing. Uh, and then, he, ironically, he spent seven years of his life in a diplomatic mission in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, which showed that he was benefiting from the traditions and laws and regulations under the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations. Assange deliberately took advantage of those benefits, which themselves guarantee confidentiality of communication between yeah. missions. So he 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 resided there for seven years. Yeah, it's uh, yeah pretty pretty ridiculous uh, when you think about all the all the things that played out over time with uh, WikiLeaks and him. Uh, you know, I wonder. You know, you mentioned several times, uh, sort of not being even handed in terms of criticism of uh, different governments. Uh, you know, WikiLeaks and the, and their issue with sort of being objective. What exactly is the relationship between WikiLeaks and the Russian government? Well, um, I, I don't know, obviously, exactly. Yeah. But the facts are that he worked for RT for yeah. a while, whilst he was in the um, Ecuadorian embassy. You don't get a job as a chat show host for RT without you know, being regarded well um, by parts of the Russian government, at least. Sure. He also, of course, with his timing of the release of the Podesta emails, which many people, I think, have, have said conclusively were done by Russian hackers, Fancy Bear or whatever it was, he, he was coordinating a release um, to downplay or to counter the impact of the Access Hollywood tapes release. Now, whether he was doing that on a day-to-day -day basis, with Russia or not, I don't know. But uh, clearly, he had got very upset with the reaction of Hillary Clinton to the uh, the WikiLeaks episode and the fact that they were trying to arrest him and so on. So he was in now in a kind of personal vendetta against the US government, in particular, I think, against Hillary Clinton, who, of course, was the opponent of um, of Donald Trump in 2016. So there were um, clearly some contacts. I think there's evidence of um, his interaction with uh, Donald Trump Jr. There's evidence of his Twitter um, records, which were, I think, produced, in fact, by Donald Trump Jr. Uh, uh, as, as trying to give counter evidence that they were not collaborating themselves, the campaign with the Russians. So. He seems to have been a sort of intermediary between the Russians who were operating, of course, the troll farm from St. Petersburg to infiltrate and influence U.S. social media for many months of the campaign. Now, how far he was connected with that, I don't think I know. I don't know whether anybody knows. But uh, there, there's a lot of evidence to say that he was well regarded by um, the Russians. And, of course, Putin himself said at Helsinki, the Helsinki summit, when, um, of course, Trump was president, that he did want Trump to win. Uh, Trump favored or, or discounted his own intelligence services on the, the Russian intervention, but yeah. Assange clearly was playing some part in that effort by the timing of the leaks of the, you know, the Podesta emails. Yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, there's definitely some sort of relationship there, um, especially at, you know, as you mentioned, the getting the the TV show gig on uh, RT for the Russian uh, Russian television network. That's uh, <laughs> that's always a bad look for anyone who's trying to be objective. I would think so. Um, yeah, I mean Ed Edward Snowden, of course, I think since has uh, and Glenn Greenwald have criticized um, Assange for not redacting 
more material to yeah. basically yeah. just dumping the material and not caring about the effects of, of what it was had. So there's been a fragmentation, you might say, of the the transparency or conspiracy um, fraternity in, in, in the way he's behaved. And he he was, of course, not just limited to the leaks we've talked about, the WikiLeaks and the Podesta emails. He did launch several or promoted several conspiracy theories, which has become, you might say, almost a daily feature of uh, you know some news channels in the United States. And yeah. conspiracy theories are still doing enormous damage to the political dialogue, the political way of resolving problems here and in, indeed in other countries. Yeah. Um, it's perhaps worth adding that, of course, Russia was not only meddling in the U.S. election. I mean, they were using their information warfare, you might say, uh, in other campaigns as well, in, in the Brexit campaign in my own country. They were trying to tip the scales for the, you know, the UK to leave when Sweden was considering NATO membership a few years back. And of course, they've reconsidered it and are joining now. So they tried to influence the, the campaigns there in, in, in social media. So Assange was not, has not been their only ally in these sort of information wars. Um, how they regard him now, I don't know, but he, he certainly was seen as a, an asset for a certain period of time by what Russia was, was trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, are you surprised at all by, by the, the number of people that sort of sympathize with figures like, you know, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks? Um, well, I, I think they're less that sympathize now. I think a lot of people sympathized initially when we were talking about the transparency Mm -hmm. objectives that the I mean the Panama Papers of course episode showed equally a lot of corruption I mean they were not directly involved in that but th they're not the only ones who've tried to reveal um, uh, sort of dastardly doings at high levels in government or companies yeah uh, and it's generally speaking it, it should be good for governments to know and companies and so on to know that um, sooner or later they're going to be digitally vulnerable yeah. to yeah. to what they say. So everything could potentially, of course, now can be copied and divulged very easily. So you have to be very careful about what you say. I mean, you, of course, you want to appear to be in your reporting and your dealings uh, to be telling the public, telling your own electorates, and so on exactly what's going on and the objectives of your foreign policy and so on. But you you have to be aware now, every organization has to be aware that, you know, um, the chickens will come home to roost if you, because you're digitally vulnerable. And that is a new, a very important new factor. Well, not so new, but an important factor to be considered in, in all diplomacy that um, digitalization has created great new vulnerabilities. In in prior times, of course, I mean, we've been talking about classified documents over the past months and how they've been misplaced and misused and covered up and so on. That used to be the main vulnerability. A spy, uh, an agent or so would, would have to go in and copy documents perhaps or um, uh, steal them or bribe somebody to, to give them up now it's it's much easier to you know an experienced hacker can go in and, and get files and videos and all the rest of it uh, on um, through digital interventions. Yeah. So I mean that's just kind of I guess the way of the world we're living in now. Um, you know what's the best way then for you know democratic governments around the world, uh, you know to show that they're trying to be as transparent as possible while also maintaining the common sense of you know not releasing information that's not going to be beneficial um to diplomatic relations it's a difficult issue often uh i think you know modern states persons and diplomats of course have to be good communicators they have to recognize that you you have to be out there on social media you have to be using traditional methods of diplomatic communication 
but you have to be selling your narrative. You have to be um, showing that you do have the interests of, of not only of your country at heart, but of all the countries you have diplomatic relations, that you're not essentially, diplomatic relations are a mutual benefit. You can't force a country to have diplomatic relations with you. You have to see some mutual benefit. So we did a lot of things with the Cuban government. We disagreed with a lot of their policies affecting human rights and openness, tolerance and so on. But we nevertheless did a lot of um, uh, projects. We were talking with them constantly. We celebrated 100 years of diplomatic relations with a big kind of festival of events in Cuba, between the UK and Cuba. But at the same time, we were talking to those who disagreed it, Cubans who were peaceful, you might say, dissidents. Yeah. So we, we were even handed. We were doing things uh, openly with the Cuban government. They disapproved of it, maybe. But we felt it was our duty in terms of our values and the way we wanted to do business with, with Cuba to talk to the opposition as well. So there was no kind of... Uh, double standards, there was no cover up in terms of what our objectives were, uh, what we were telling our own public, what we were telling our own, what we were telling the Cuban government. We said we want to do things with you, but we'd also like you to be more open with your society, you know, not arrest people for protesting about price rises or unemployment and not jailing people for um, raising petitions to the government, which were perfectly legal. So we, I don't think we were, I mean, clearly that goes on in diplomacy, but it's, uh, you, you have to draw a line between sort of how deceitful you are. If you're going to have diplomatic relations with a country to do business with whoever it is, uh, there has to be trust. I mean, the moment you start deceiving a country in your communications with a country or with an organization about what your true objectives are, they realize that and, and you're, you're kind of written off as a diplomatic interlocutor. The, the problem with, um, I mean, the Assange philosophy is it is the job of a diplomat. It's the job of somebody who represents a government to report uh, what's going on in a country, warts and all. You're supposed to say, as I know somebody did who lost his job, if you're the US ambassador in Mexico, you report on how you see where US aid is going, US support for the police is going. Is there corruption? You're not supposed to say, no, everything's fine. I mean, that's your job. And of course, that's what um, Julian Assange professes to detest, is this, this honest reporting. Uh, yes, of course, in, in times of war, there are going to be abuses of civilians. And of course, we hope our governments will bring them to account if, if soldiers behave badly. And that was, of course, one of the central things he hoped to reveal. But, um, you know, that that's the job of a democratic government. And uh, if you uh, are subject to military abuses, I think there are enough investigative journalists around, there are enough NGOs around to surface those abuses and to, to make governments accountable. We wish, of course, it were the same in all governments which are non-democratic, where there is no investigative journalism, really, which which holds government to account. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And I think I just a lot of the misunderstanding for, you know, people in the public that have never met someone in government, that have never <laughs> been a part of government, you know, that can really buy into sort of the conspiracy theories that get thrown around. You know, is that you know, mo most people in government are just normal people that got jobs in government. You know, <laughs> they're not people that have these alternative, you know, these special motives to do things in secrecy. Um, you know, a government has to function a certain way in the world. And um, a lot of people just don't have a good understanding of how that that happens. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like one of the one of the keys, especially in this world of uh, sort of misinformation, disinformation being such a major issue. Um, it seems like a, a big thing, hopefully, for uh, future generations will be kind of having a better understanding about how government works, how diplomacy works. Um, you know, this should be something in education systems that kids are being taught mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, we're in a world now where we have people that are believing in all sorts of things um, and it's incredibly dangerous as a result. 
Right. And I think a, a related issue to that is the future of the United Nations, which is the yeah. obviously the main diplomatic body. We saw last month that the only member, head of government of the permanent five members of the United Nations that actually showed up to the big, you might say, jamboree of the year, the UN General Assembly, was Joe Biden. Yeah. Uh, the others gave it a miss. They don't see any upside for them in now appearing at that podium. Anthony, Antonio Guterres, who I actually knew very well in Portugal when he was a politician, is lamenting the fact that the world just doesn't come together. The world is not confronting the conflicts and not confronting the key issues. You've had a permanent member of the UN Security Council invade another country, Russia invading Ukraine, which is the, the central breach of the principles of the Charter of the United Nations, which Antonio Guterres referred to last week. Uh, so that is this, another central challenge to diplomacy. It's not so much about whether you know, confidential cables are being leaked and you, you reveal the kind of double standards of, of many countries, but do we really see how, how our common interests on this planet as working on the issues of climate, of yep. health and pandemics, of refugees? Because no country can solve those. They're all our own common problems. And that's where the diplomacy of the United Nations is, is so important. And why there is a real question mark over whether it can survive meaningfully. Politicians prefer to go to the BRICS meetings or the G20 meetings or the Davos meetings in Switzerland. There's, there's no challenges to them. There's no kind of legal accountability. They meet with countries who they think think alike so there's no pressure to build consensus and that is a, a central aspect i think that many diplomats see that uh, we're all toiling essentially as problem solvers uh you don't come into diplomacy thinking it, you're going to win the world series there's no country that ever want, wins the world series it's a constant battle of you know trying to put out fires or do things together collaboratively and, and there is a new, um, um, you might say, um, kind of volatility in diplomatic relations, a call of extempore. There are no real solid alliances where one country sticks with an alliance on every issue. You see it within NATO countries, within the EU countries. China has made big inroads with the Belt Road Initiative with, with several NATO and, and EU countries. Equally, you know, Brazil and Saudi Arabia, um, India, of course, are involved in many different groupings diplomatically. So the world is more um, uh, versatile, you might say, in diplomacy, also unpredictable. Yeah. Look, look what's happened with the, uh, the Hamas-Israel conflict. You've had some Arab governments um, who've just signed agreements with Israel. Um, hedging their bets now, suggesting that it was Israel that's provoked the attack. There's more concentration on uh, the Palestine issue now when the UAE and uh, Bahrain and other countries signed those agreements. It seemed as if the Palestine issue was no longer um, central. Mm. What, what's the Russian relationship with Iran now in relation to that, where you have, of course, millions of Russian speakers live in Israel. It's the dominant language in Israel. So very complicated international interactions on, on different issues. And that's where, you know, dipl diplomacy and diplomats are very important. Yeah. Yeah. Plenty of work for uh, diplomats uh, for the foreseeable future, I think. So mm -hmm. um, now uh, just finishing up, I guess, uh, you know, what are you currently working on and uh, what's the best way for people to keep track of your work? Um, well, a group of us are actually, um, not just at Boston University, we've, we've had 40 um, authors from some 30 countries address the issue of the reform of diplomacy and the use of innovation in diplomacy. And we, we published a handbook in February. So if anybody's interested in, in reading it, uh, we deliberately went to uh, authors from many different countries. We have authors from China, we have an author from Russia, um, Brazil, uh, Mexico, India, many European countries, African countries, so Australia, 
So I think we got an interesting perspective and we're trying to work with the UN on promoting some diplomatic discussions. One of our authors is in fact, the head of innovation currently at the United Nations, uh, Martin Weilish. So we, we do believe in the future of the UN, but we believe there's a lot of work that needs to be done by simply addressing diplomacy again amongst the states, the value of diplomacy, settling disputes, not violating sovereignty is uh, so uh, maybe some of your listeners and viewers will will find those ideas of interest. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, definitely a important topic for sure. So, well, thank you so much for coming on to share all your knowledge. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ben. Hope to talk again soon. Absolutely.